And then kind of going off of that, I think everyone should experience getting laid. <laughs> I mean, you know, it sounds silly. That I mean, that, that's going to be the opening right there. Yeah. Everyone should everyone should get laid. Wait, what, what type of interview are we doing here? <laughs> Sorry, did you want to continue with that thought? I yeah, want to expand on it. Um, I know it was a big deal for me. <laughs> <laughs> You're just digging deeper here, George. <laughs> This is George McHale, uh, co-creator of Cover Darkness. Uh, it's available from SourcePoint Press. So ask your retailer to bring that in for you. And you're watching Two Geeks Talking. This is Chris Cam. I'm co-creator of Cover of Darkness, the graphic novel series. And you can order it now from SourcePoint Press at your local comic book shop. And you're watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by two very talented creative people. Uh, you've heard one of the guests on the show in the past, of course, George McHale from uh, Resilient. But we are also joined by a co-creator of their new series. Joining us today, we have George McHale and Chris Cam from the comic cover of darkness which is a really interesting horror and vampire lore and all that other fun stuff in fact i'll let them talk to you all about it how is everyone doing today we're doing good it's the weekend so we're happy we're, we're sitting and we got tea it's a good day yeah thanks for having us so for those that don't know anything about cover of darkness tell us what it's all about cover of darkness is like game of thrones meets universal monsters it's about a family in medieval romania they get separated from each other. Oh, no, right? And they encounter vampires, Viking werewolves, the mummy, a creature from the Black Lagoon, and a steampunk Atlantean Frankenstein. So it's basically our, our family's story back to each other. They're trying to reunite. And one thing that's really fun about it is within the family, we have twin shape-shifting boys that can turn into animals. So you get gorillas fighting werewolves. Fantasy meets horror. It's, it's, a, it's a fun new series out from uh, SourcePoint Press, available to pre-order at your local comic book store. So then how did you two both come up with the idea of this particular concept? I mean, passion obviously for for the monster genre is, is always wonderful to have, but, but how did you both meet in terms of this comic? I think that's probably one of my favorite stories is so George and I are, are cousins. He loves loved comics and got me into comics as a kid. And I love reading horror, urban fantasy, dark fantasy. That's kind of my shtick that I love to read. One day we were walking through Ikea and George had written his first comic book series at that point, Fire Engine Red, and he was done with it. And he turned to me and he's like, we should write something together. And we both love comics and he loves the universal monsters. And he's like, I have a mummy story I want to tell. And I'm like, well, I have this really great Frankenstein story and it's set in Atlantis. And I want to tell that story. And then just went, from there and just built this idea of using the universal monsters. And then we created a family that we brutally tear apart and put on a collision course with some of the worst monsters we can think of. And it's been a lot of fun to write from there. Uh, Crystal and I are, are, are super close. Like we grew up together in a way, like uh, she would come like, and, and, and visit me like uh, every summer, like me and my family uh, growing up and for like a solid two months. And she's a couple of years older than me. And I remember like going into her room and like Saturday morning and like throwing like Nerf balls at her. And so she would like get up and like come and watch, you know, X-Men with me and Batman the Animated Series with me. So, and she would, and, and we would, you know, kind of nerd out on these things together. And, and, and Crystal's like worked in, in bookstores and she's started novels and and I always loved writing and and fiction and so it's like who else would i want to work on uh you know this project and you know crystal and then so we came up with, uh, with the with cover darkness together and yeah we've been rolling on it for a few years now so what's the most misunderstood aspect about the monster genre that you know people maybe are turned off by past media representations of oh that's a great question um well i think a lot of people think it's sadistic and gory and people that like this might be kind of weird but i don't know i think everyone can relate to being afraid and, and so putting our characters in traumatic places and situations is is fun and, and for, for me some people don't understand what the appeal of horror is and they think like why put yourself through this and, and why be anxious and there's enough there's enough 
anxiety in the world, right? But for me, it's like a roller coaster. You know you're safe. You you know you're going to be okay, but you have that thrill, that that drop, and uh, and the same thing with four. You know you it, it, it gets the adrenaline going, but you're you're safe. You're okay, so it makes it fun. For me, one thing that is a bit of a challenge is people have the monsters in the head in their head, and they have an idea of what they love their monsters to be. And for us, we took each of the monsters and we did our own take on them. And so sometimes it can be a little bit of massaging to get somebody to. Just, to be like, okay, it's okay that you messed with my favorite Frankenstein or my idea of this vampire and what I love. And uh, so that's one of the things that I think is challenging within uh, people have set ideas and tropes in their head of what a vampire should be or Frankenstein should be. What is the most favorite aspect about writing these monsters? Yeah, I like uh, just doing the new kind of twists on them and, and seeing how we're going to take this familiar story and do something new with it and do something fun it's- that's my favorite part of, of writing them. And then as the series progresses, you've got you know, the mummy and the wolfman meeting and what's that encounter going to be like and just kind of having new situations that you don't see all the time. That's, that's what's, what's the most fun for me. I would agree with you, taking them and making them our own. And that's the, my favorite part. And, you know, just going for our, our werewolf origin story was just, totally inspired from a comment that George had written from one of the characters uh, using a reference to Odin in the middle of Transylvania in the Middle Ages. And I'm like, okay, well, Odin wouldn't be known, but how could he be known? How can we make this happen? So it was a challenge. It was a lot of fun making that happen. So then out of the monsters that you both love, what if you could turn into one of these monsters, like maybe not for the rest uh, of your life or whatever, yeah. who would you be and why? You got to go with the vampire, right? Like, <laughs> I'm going to disagree with you. I, I was thinking the uh, invisible woman, maybe, or the werewolf. I think those are two that are calling to me right now. But ask me tomorrow and I'm sure I'll have a different choice tomorrow. Yeah, I just like the long life. Come on, that sounds, that sounds pretty good. I don't know. Maybe it has its flaws, but I, I yeah, vampires... They kind of have it going on. And they also have like this kind of sex appeal to them too. Like, I don't know. Like, I, I like, they just seem to like draw in the women, at least in like movies. <laughs> that seems all right. I don't know. That could also be creative editing as well too. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Depends on who wrote the script. <laughs> uh, speaking of script writing though, when it comes to the, the collaboration that you both have and, and the fact that you both brought your own stories to this and you've, you've created this world of Cover of Darkness, which I think is a great title as well, by the way. Looking at the stories that you've created and the stories that are in this particular series, what was the hardest story for you both to write and collaborate on? So we kind of have our own characters that we write. Like, so it's a, it's about a family. And so we have um, five different family members. And I think one thing that can be a challenge is we, we kind of write our own characters. Like we have, we each have like two and then we kind of share one. And we go back and forth like that. And sometimes it's really easy to just write your own character and you have it, but then we have to make sure everything connects. And we have to make sure that when our characters run into each other, then uh, we're kind of playing with each other's action figures in a way, you know? So <laughs> it can be a little tricky because it's like, hey, uh, I think this should happen. But it's like, yeah, but that character wouldn't do that. And, yeah, and you have like a little bit of possession over for shared characters, right? Because we kind of have our favorites. Yeah, I think another side to it is when we were first starting, do you remember, George? And we were coming up with all of our, our ideas for all of our uh, monsters. We were really stuck on the vampire story. What is his origin story? What is what, Where do we see him coming from in our world? And I was uh, drawing a blank. I'm like, I, I was thinking a, a, a grave digger. Like, uh, I just have this picture in my head of... Uh, a vampire in a crypt, totally like emaciated, just totally starving. And uh, suddenly these grave diggers show up. And I'm like, I just have this one scene. I didn't have a story behind that. And George is like, hey, hey, you know what? That inspires me. And George ran off and he totally was able to pull from that scene that inspired him enough to create the origin for our vampire. And uh, I thought that was a really awesome way that we kind of helped each other and riffed with together to create something that neither one of us really had something that we felt was solid until we put our ability to work together into play. And so you know, this idea with inspired George in this way, and George has definitely done the same, you know, I was thinking this with this character, which I don't want to give anything away for anybody who hasn't read it, but uh, it'll inspire me and I'll be like, yeah, that's absolutely fantastic. Obviously the editing process can be sometimes 
it can be a, an energizing thing. Sometimes it can be a struggle. It depends on the person and how sadistic they may be when it comes to, you know, editing works. I, I know video editing is, is a pain for me. Uh, what did you edit out of the book that you wanted to keep in? We spent a lot of time um, planning out our book. So before we started writing, we mapped out with like poster boards and like little post-it notes, uh, all five of our main characters, where they were going, what the plot was, what was happening with them, how they were feeling emotionally throughout uh, throughout the story. And, and we really put a lot of time in mapping this thing out um, before we ever got started. So... We haven't really cut that much. And, and yeah, honestly, like, sometimes like our, our issues aren't all the same length. Sometimes we have 22 pages. Other times we have 28 pages just because we've got more story to tell. So we, we, we know what we're, where, where we're going and, and how we want to get there. And so we're not having to cut a lot of it. As far as like editing process, though, like we write our own um, kind of sections of the comic. And, and then Crystal will send her... her Chris will send her stories to me and I'll, uh, and I'll kind of put them in, in whatever order I feel like makes sense and kind of put the, the issue together um, from my stories and her stories. So I, I, I put the, the book in sequence. You touched on a key point is that we would rather tell the story that needs to be told than edit out down to 22 pages. So when we feel like there's just this juicy bit that we need to get in there, we'll extend the issue like to 28 pages where more standardly we try and stick to a 22 page story. I will say that one thing that I'm sorry that we weren't able to get in was, was writing the origin story for two of our characters that we couldn't fit into the actual story itself. We just had so much that to have an additional six pages of origin story for one, these two particular monsters, they each had their own origin, was just too much to add in. But we came up with a really awesome solution to that, I feel. And George can talk about that one, actually. Yeah, we're working on a, an anthology project uh, for Cover Darkness that will be released uh, from SourcePoint Press in the future. It's going to be released as three one-shots. And uh, we are working with a bunch of different artists. I'll, I'll give you a scoop here. We're working with the uh, legendary like uh, Identity Crisis action comics artist uh, Rags Morales is mm -hmm. illustrating one of our short stories. Um, we also have uh, Andy Belanger from Swamp Thing, John Delaney from uh, uh, Justice League Adventures. So we have a bunch of short stories uh, that kind of expand our universe that are going to be collected into three different uh, one shots uh, coming out in a, in a future time. You, you brought up Source, Source Point Press as the publisher for the particular series. What has Source Point Press brought to yourselves as creators? Well, they're really behind the comic. They put uh, a two page advertisement for us in, uh, in Previews Magazine. Uh, it looks awesome. And they're just really like cheerleading their project they're doing ads in the back of their of their own comic books advertising cover darkness and i know that they're reaching out to retailers telling them to bring this book in source points um really just blowing up right now they're they're sponsoring like new york comic con uh emerald city c2e2 um they have like a board game division that they're killing it on a bunch of their properties are in uh development with uh, film and television so yeah we're excited to be part of that team and, and also they recently just signed with uh, Simon & Schuster. The Cover Darkness graphic novel will not only be in comic book stores, but it'll also be in um, in like Barnes and & Nobles. And Looking back as your career as a writer, what would be one thing that you would give up to become a better writer? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. That's a great question. I think that uh, writing takes more time than I ever thought that it would. And so to become a better writer, I think I would have to give up um, I have a, I, I work part-time at the bookstore still, and I'm keeping my toes in, in the water there. And I think that um, to become a better writer, that'd be, have to be something that I'd give up. And I'm not quite willing to, because I still love working in the book industry and being out there with people who love books and talking about what I'm passionate about and love. I'd have to give up procrastinating. <laughs> That's the worst thing. Would like, that be I'm, so bad? <laughs> yeah, because like I'm my own worst enemy, right? I, and oftentimes I'll have like a story like just, rolling around in my brain for months and months and months and it's like i just got to get this thing on paper like honestly i've got uh, my resilience script right now I'm, I'm finishing the first story arc of it like uh issue five and i've had like those last 10 pages to write for like since the summer so it's been like 
<laughs> it's been so long and the artist is like caught up to me and he's waiting for pages and i'm just like i just gotta do it but the thing about like writing that i find um challenging is that it can almost be painful when you're like trying to get that first draft out it's like you're just second guessing every second and you're like is this good i don't know if this is good oh i don't know if that's right that dialogue doesn't sound good but what I realized is that you have to get that first draft down, no matter how painful it is, because you can't improve your story until it's on paper. As long as it's rolling around in your brain, it's not really going to get better. It's you got, you got to put it down and then start figuring out how am I going to improve this? How am I going to make this sharp and, and a final draft? You look at the history of these monsters. They, they've been around for centuries. They've been around in not only folklore, but but history, and of course, it popularized in the media as well, too, here. What are the ethics about writing for these types of historical figures that are, are known and loved throughout the world? Uh, well, we want to make sure that we make these characters our own and not just, like, retell the same the same stories, because that's someone else's work, right? So we're, we're trying to just do our own thing, like, take this character put a new twist on him and put it, put him in new situations and then really build, turn it into our own. Not that it's unethical. Like these are, it's, it's legally, it, you know, these characters are in the public domain. You can use them you can retell the same story and just put art to it, which other creators do, you know, and that's fine, but that's, that's not what we're trying to do. And, and to me, that doesn't feel like as creative as, as kind of making your own thing with them. I think the other thing is trying to maintain a respect for the fan base because people love these creatures. And so we want to have respect for some of that. And what I'm thinking of specifically is a lot of people come and they love Frankenstein's monster and they are just like, well, it's, you're calling him Frankenstein, but he's the monster. And so just dealing with their uh, questions with respect and giving them, well, this is my take and this is why I did that, but I respect that you love Frankenstein in your way and really holding that we all have our fandoms that we all adore and that this is our take on that story and just trying to keep little pieces and nuggets of the historical um, genre and canon behind each of these characters that we really hold true. So with Frankenstein, he is a monster that was created from parts of the uh, human in our story. And we've just changed it so that it's his wife that is resurrecting him and bringing him back. And so keeping parts of it that really enhance the story for us. Did you guys hide any Easter eggs in these stories that are, uh, you know, might be interesting to, to see maybe either historical or otherwise? A little bit. Um, there's a couple things that I have worked in. Um, I'll give you one if you take a look. There's often in a lot of the stories, not in all of them, you'll see a raven in the background. And there's a reason why there's this random raven in the background of a bunch of the stories that are being told throughout them. And if we keep going and if it comes to fruition, there's a reason why there's a raven watching all of these going on throughout the story. Uh, little things like that, little comments that we'll, we'll jump back to that in issue 11, we're working in a character that is just randomly mentioned. I think it's in issue six, you get one mention of this character and then comes out full force in issue 11. And you're just like, wow, I'm hit in the face by this character. So it's a lot of fun. Fairly obvious Easter eggs in our thing is like, so we've got Frankenstein's widow. Her name is Mary after Mary Shelley in uh, our mommy story resurrected by uh, the sun god Ra in our version. And uh, we gave the sun god like a fez, like Boris Karloff wore in, in the Mummy uh, movie. Little kind of nods to things here and there that like if you're a fan of this genre, you'll, you'll notice and you'll get it for sure. So what is your favorite childhood book then? I don't know if I have a favorite. Like I was big into the Goosebumps when I was a kid like the R.L. Stein, um, I just blew through those, especially the one with the, uh, with the dummy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that's like the most sophisticated answer or anything like that, <laughs> but I just, like, I love those books. I also love the Choose Your Own Adventures. Um, yes. Those are fun, man. And you could, and I'd like reread them like over and over again just to see like, where is this thing going to go? Or, you know, it, I, I, I love those books. I got into Stephen King way too young, and I'm still a fan. That man can write, and I appreciate what he's written. I, I love his early stuff, even his new stuff. He's doing amazing stuff. So then what is your most recent literary pilgrimage that you've gone on? 
picked up uh, Stray Dogs from Image Comics. Yeah, I I tabled next to uh, Tone Rodriguez. Uh, he's one of the illustrators in the in the book. I wasn't really sure on it because it's like it's a horror kind of mystery um, about dogs and like they're they're all in this house and like and it's done in a real animated style. I think the the writer worked on like My Little Pony, and I was like, I don't know if this is for me, and it's good, man. It was. Uh, I really like the characters and, uh, and yeah, and, and Tone's killing it on the book there. So I, I just recently picked up Stray Dogs and I, I totally. I've been reading The Resistance, which is a series that's come out through the uh, pandemic, through COVID. And it's fantastic. I'm absolutely loving it. And it's about a, uh, a pandemic that hits the earth and people who get superpowers as a result of it. And I'm absolutely loving it. It's fantastic. And they did a six Siri, uh, six story arc, and they've actually put out multiple ones that tie in beautifully to that series. So it's fantastic. At what point are we good enough? I think that there is no such thing as perfect. So I think when you can lay your head down at the end of the day and know that you've put in the best effort for the day, then you are good enough. When I first started doing conventions, I was having like a really hard time emotionally. Like I would put a lot of pressure on myself trying to recoup art costs. I'm trying to pay for my airfare and hotel possibly. And so I've got to sell, I got to sell, 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 sell. And, uh, and I feel like so rejected if I, if I, if I didn't uh, do well at a show, maybe I, you know, I didn't hit my goal and I was just beating myself up emotionally and like just feeling kind of miserable sometimes. And, and I was talking with the, uh, uh, his name's Garrett Gunn. He's a, uh, he's another source point uh, press writer. Uh, he does like war corns and uh, good boy. And uh, he said to me, he's like, do you really want someone to like buy your comic that, you know, um, didn't necessarily want it. They just kind of like really felt like you were desperate. I'm like, no, I don't want that at all. I only want people that like are into my thing to get it. And if they don't want to buy it, that's fine. It's like, well, just take a breath, man. Just, just breathe. And, and I, kind of really took that to heart and I was and I started to realize like all I can do is the best I can do I'm you know things that are outside of my control don't lose too much sleep over just just try your best and you know and and don't worry so much about the results and actually ever since I've kind of adopted that mentality um I've been actually a lot more successful at selling my comments so just kind of relax a bit and uh and just try your best but don't worry about the outcome if it's not within your control. What's something that you think every person should experience once in their lifetime? (laughs) I'm sorry. You're giving us like tough ones and I'm having to think normally I'm a little bit sharper, but. Okay. I'll 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 take this one. I think. Appreciate you. (laughs) I think everybody should experience uh, raising a child at least once in their lifetime and just Yeah, the amount of time that needs to be put into a child and um, how they make demands on your life in ways that I never even anticipated. I think that's something that everybody should experience once, whether it be your own child or another. Give them your all and it's an experience like no other. And then kind of going off of that, I think everyone should experience getting laid. (laughs) 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 You know, it sounds silly. I've spent a lot of time working with adults with developmental disabilities of uh, you know, over 20 years in the field. And sometimes that's like, that's a really hard thing for a lot of people that don't know how to go about finding a sexual partner. And that's, that can be kind of heartbreaking to, you know, see people who want to want to do that, don't know how to do it. And everyone should do that at least once. Yeah. No, that <laughs> makes perfect sense. For like 13 years, that's the first time I've, I've had that question answered like that. So you're <laughs> first. Congratulations. <laughs> that I mean, that, that's going to be the opening right there. <laughs> everyone should everyone should get laid. Wait, what what type of interview are we doing here? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, did you want to continue with that thought? Yeah, I want to expand on it. Um, I know it was a big deal for me. <laughs> <laughs> You're just digging deeper here, George. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> What is the wisest thing that you've heard someone say to you that has stuck with you in your career? I've kind of touched on on this already, but you can't make it uh, better until until it's down on paper. Uh, a lot of people call it the vo- vomit draft or, you know, whatever. The, the, the first draft of your comic, I think it was 
was it Mark Duplass or something like that? He's like a, a screenwriter. I was watching a YouTube video with him. Kind of clicked, right? Because before I had heard that kind of piece of advice, which sounds obvious, but I don't know. I'm, I'm a dummy. <laughs> so I just, I was really struggling to make it perfect on like my first draft and, and like, and then just kind of hating the process and, and just hearing that, like, you can't make it better until it's, it's on paper. That just stuck with me. And it's like, okay, this, so this is just part of the process is, is writing it down, feeling uncomfortable, feeling unsure of yourself. That's, that's all part of it. And, and then once it's there, then you can work on a second, third. For my first comic book script, uh, Fire Engine Red, I did five drafts of the, of the story and just kind of kept on revisiting it and, and, and made a pretty solid story. And, and, now I take that uh, into account every time I'm sitting down to write and it just makes things easier. Mine is actually very similar to George's actually. It is uh, when you have a dream, if you actually want it to come to fruition, you have to take action. So just do it, get it written, write it, whether it's good or bad, that's not what you're doing. You're making your dream come true. So write it, go back and edit it if you have to, but if you don't write it, then you don't have it. It, you haven't taken the action that you need to take specifically. Yeah. What lessons in life did you learn the hard way? Ah, uh, that I can't learn from mistake, other people's mistakes as well as I wish I could. <laughs> yeah. That's, I think for me, a, a big one. The, the hard way is that I have to do it and I have to do it myself to learn from a lesson in a lot of things in life. Don't take for granted the time that you have for pe with people. You know, uh, my dad passed away when I was in high school. And I didn't see that coming. I thought he was going to be around for a long time. And so I try and just, you know, value my relationships, make time for, um, for people show up, you know, if someone invites you to like a wedding or there's a funeral or a birthday party, just go, <laughs> you know, I think that lots of times people try and, you know, find excuses or, you know, and, and don't, don't show up for their friends. And like, if someone's moving, like, I know it sucks, but just show up for them, you know, help them with their boxes and their couch and, and just, just show up for your, for people, be, be present. And, and I, for me, that's kind of a big takeaway from, from my dad passing away was, you know, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to make sure I am a good friend, a good, you know, a good part of the family. What would be the title of your life if it was a movie? That's a hard one. That's a good one, but that's a hard one. I've got nothing. Apparently, I have no catchy titles in my life. <laughs> See, I'm just trying to think in my head here. So uh, basically, I think like something like, oh, this is going to sound stupid too. All right, I'll just say it. Kurt. <laughs> uh, maybe something like Shy Boy, something like that. Because for, for a good chunk of my life, I wanted to be a creative person. And I was really nervous about putting myself out there. I was really afraid of being rejected. That was huge. And like I'm turning 40 here pretty soon and I always wanted to work in comics and I've only been doing it for a few years now. So there was, there was like solid, solid 15 to 18 years where I could have been doing this and I could have been, you know, making my dreams come true and, and, and going on these fun adventures and, and making comics, but I was too shy. I was just I was too nervous to put myself out there so I was, I was gonna say you came up with getting laid quicker than you came up with the, your movie title <laughs> <laughs> yeah you did <laughs> i'm just gonna see say chris cam comma author That's... no come on like super mom super mom super like mom that. all right well i like that one crystal has two boys uh xander and xavier and uh and she's she calls them her x-men Thank you. To me, my X Men. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you don't need to use the mental powers either. You just need the look. <laughs> look of a mother. Well, or sometimes oh. Banshee's shout. That that works yeah, too. Yeah. <laughs> now if you smell brimstone, you know who's teleporting where. Yeah. Oh. All right. I'll get into my last four question. But before I do that, is there anything that I haven't touched upon that you'd like to showcase to those that are watching and listening to this interview? No, I think you've had some great questions. You've definitely made me think. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? And this is for both. 
I'm going to say straight up, George, I uh, I told him once that I absolutely admire his passion for going after his dreams. It's something that is out there for me that I just watch him out there actively chasing his dreams. And that inspires me every day, 100%. I guess I kind of have to say Crystal now. No, you don't. Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> no, yeah, Chris is an inspiration um, for sure. Of the way she lives her life and she's dedicated to her family and to her work and making her goals happen too. Another inspiration for me is uh, uh, my friend John Delaney. John is a comic book artist and uh, his story was that he applied for uh, DC and Marvel um, every few months for, I think, 16 years. Like, he started right out of high school, and it wasn't until, like, his mid-30s that he landed a, a gig with the, with the big two there. Just didn't give up, you know? Just, you know, he was working on other things, of course, right? But just kept on getting after it, and uh, that, that's inspirational to me, you know? Just keep, to keep going, and, and you never know what'll happen. From a professional perspective, you have both created an amazing comic book with Cover of Darkness, and I'm sure you're you're still continuing to write many more amazing works in the future, and I can't wait to see what you both create together. From a professional perspective, you're both su- successful. Personally, do you consider yourself successful? Um, I'm really feeling validated having uh, the series picked up by a publisher, um, so I'm starting to feel successful. I feel like I'm turning the corner. I'm getting there. Um, being with Source Point is great. It's opening doors. Uh, I'm going to be at San Diego Comic Con this year. I got a table there. Like that's awesome. Those things weren't happening before, and and now things are doors are starting to open. And uh, yeah, so I'm I'm feeling. I don't know if I feel like I'm a big success, but I feel like I'm becoming successful, and it's 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 a lot of fun. It's great. Um, I think for me, I would say that I absolutely professionally, this is, this is the dream to actually have a paper copy of something that I wrote is just for me, that is a level of success that makes my heart so happy. It was amazing. The first time I held a copy because George and I, um, independently printed our book before we were picked up by source point press. And then to take that to the next level and be picked up by a publisher that just takes it to a whole new level for me from a professional standpoint, from a personal standpoint, I had a job that I, I loved. I absolutely adored for 20 years before I had kids and, uh, to have a, a, a career that I absolutely love now to have gone beyond a career and raised two children that I absolutely adore as well. So I feel like I'm very blessed and I have family that I love and I have a job and a career that I love. So I'm, I'm definitely successful, but also very lucky. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? For me, I think that I try and reflect on what made it a failure. There are things in our life that we can have no control of. And for those, I try and reflect and think, all right, this was out of my control. For things that I fail at due to my own control, well, what can I change next time? What can I do better with? I think that I'm not somebody who goes back through life with a lot of regrets. It's something that I don't think is very very productive going forward. So I'm somebody who has an attitude of, if I fail, how can I learn from it and do better next time? So I I talk through my failures. Uh, My wife is my best friend and she's a very patient woman and she'll listen to me bitch and moan about how things didn't go the way I wanted to. And and, uh, just kind of getting it off my chest really helps a lot with whatever is happening, right? And yeah, just having someone to, to share your life with and share your problems with makes everything seem so much more manageable. So that's it. And drinking. <laughs> Have a couple of beers and things are just going bad. Blow off some steam. The younger generation is looking at your work and you, they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a comic writer, as a, an artist, as YouTuber, whatever they'd like to be creative with. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Uh, I think that how the next generation can inspire those to that come after are that they can live their best life, that they can do chase their dreams and do everything they can to be the best person that they can be, whether that be that as a creator, as somebody who's making a difference in the world, or as a parent who's raising the next generation. I think if they're doing the best they can every single day, then they're going to inspire the next generation.
like I, I touched on this before when, when I was on last time, but I think that this new generation kind of coming up is um, they, they don't need to be inspired. They're they're They, I don't think they have the same hangups about being creative and being putting themselves out there. Like there's a lot of 13 year olds that, you know, have YouTube channels, <laughs> like people are doing it. Um, I think you just got to be good at it. Um, you know, and, and be objective, you know, what, no matter what you're doing, just, take yourself outside of the project and, and look at it objectively. Like, you know, I didn't know how to make comic books until I started making them. And I kind of, uh, uh, relate it to like a home renovation project. Like, I don't know how to tile a backsplash, but I'm sure I can figure it out. Uh, the, the, and lots of people do that, those sort of things, like those kind of home renovation projects, but it's whether or not you have the objective eye and be able to be like, okay, that stinks. I'm going to tear it down and start over again. And and try again and try again and try again until it's perfect. And so I think like anybody can do these things. I don't, I'm not a big buyer into talents. I think people who are talented have been doing it a long time and been, and kind of know what they're doing. I don't think it's like this God given thing. So uh, yeah, my answer is just, you know, make sure you're good at it and, uh, and be objective. I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of two geeks talking, but before I let you go, where can we, find you and how can we support you both and of course where can we find cover of darkness as well uh you can find me on instagram at comic book george uh, i'm on youtube with uh, inside comics um and i have a uh, which is kind of like how to do it sort of thing as far as making comic books and then i have a movie review show called inside movies where it's me and a couple of comic book writers and we just nerd out about like old action movies like predator and rambo and stuff like that so and you can find me on instagram that's the main way to follow me i am at cam crystal c-h-r-i-s-t-a-l so um at on instagram that's the main place that you can find me you can find cover of darkness we're actually coming out january 19th 2022 and we're in previews right magazine right now so if you're it sounds like something that you like if you like our monster world uh head out to your local comic book shop and ask them to bring it in for you awesome. wonderful I, congratulations both on on a, on a fun comic I, I love the story i can't wait to see more of it for sure too and it sounds like an amazing journey that you both are, are continuing on to create so congratulations well thanks so much kurt yeah thank you for having us kurt anytime well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. Of course, you can find this interview and thousands of others since 2008 on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. And of course, on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash C forward slash tgtmedia. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening watching on Two Geeks Talking. Hey all, Kurt Sasso here from Two Geeks Talking. If you like this video and these quick clips here, make sure you take a look at our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash TGT Media. Make sure you hit the like button and subscribe as well. Hit the bell to make sure you get notifications, of course, from videos like this here. Thank you everyone for listening and watching over the years and keep listening and watching for new and exciting interviews with talented and creative people in the entertainment industry. I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. Thank you so much.